I am a little bit under the weather, so my introduction will be mercifully brief, um, I think, for all of us. Also, we're starting a little late, um, coming in from breakfast and coffee on the first morning, so it's okay if we run over. We put a, plenty of time in between sessions, um, so don't, don't worry about, about running over. Um, uh, last night, uh, uh, in casual conversation, uh, I was calling him um, Reiner, but uh, this morning he's Dr. Knizia, and um, he is really uh, among one of the sort of legendary figures in the field that we all share, game design. Um, what, are, what are some of your favorite uh, Knizia games? Through the Desert. Through the Desert? Confrontation. Uh, uh, Confrontation. Uh, What's that? Tigris and Euphrates, Lost, 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 Lost Cities, Cities, Lord of the Rings, Lord of the Ring board Rings. game. Right, so really some of the most influential works in, in, in paper gaming over the last um, few decades. And I think that it, he's really touched um, most or all of us with his work. And it's really a pleasure to have him um, begin this conference and, and share some of it, his insights with us. And I, I also, though, I want I don't want our uh, veneration of his uh, contribution to our field to keep us from asking hard questions and, um, and, and having a good dialogue afterwards. So I just want to echo what Frank said, which is that, in my opinion, um, the, the highest form of respect that one designer can show another is, is really a tough uh, constructive criticism, right? On whatever, on their ideas, on their work, on, on, something, that, on something that pops up in a conversation. <laughs> so so we, we, want to, you know, we want to show respect to, to each <laughs> other throughout the conference by, by engaging in these really uh, uh, critical discussions in a, in a, in a, in a very um, passionate way. That's why we're here. Otherwise, it's just a missed opportunity. And without further ado, uh, everyone, Dr. Uh, Knizia. Good morning. I'm still Rhino. <laughs> it's a great honor and an enormous pleasure to be here and to give this talk this morning. Uh, I've been looking forward to it. And as it's the first talk, I can promise you that it can only get better afterwards. <laughs> um, I have to start with an apology. My suitcase hasn't arrived. Oh. So uh, oh. with this respect, uh, I couldn't dress up for the occasion, and I have to <laughs> stand in front of you with my traveling clothes. <laughs> I also um, have a confession to make. Um, I actually don't like the sessions, uh, the making of, which is kind of self-promoting and just what we did and look how great we are. So I promised myself I would never give one of these sessions. And uh, due to the persuasiveness of Eric Zimmerman, <laughs> here I am. Uh, and I can only promise I will never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm talking about this game. Who was it? It has been on the market in uh, Germany and in some European countries since uh, three years. But the English language edition has just come out last month. So we are actually talking about a brand new game for your market. And because it is very heavily language dependent, it's actually something which you only now can experience. Um, and I want to go right back to the beginnings. And this was the beginning. That means uh, Ravensburger, one of the market leaders in non-electronic games in Europe, has approached me. They're a very good partner or a very good publisher for me. And they've approached me and said, we have a new technology. Um, you have a little light bulb? With one hand, you touch the battery. And then the novelty is we have conductive ink, which we can now use in games. So we have a board, and we can print on this with conductive ink. So when you uh, touch the board with your other hand, then the light bulb starts. And so they said, can you make a game out of it? I, said, I thought about it, and I said, yes. Look, you touch there, and the light bulb goes on. You touch here, the light bulb goes on, and you touch there, and there, and there, and there. <laughs> and I think a two-year-old will have really entertainment for many hours on this. <laughs> and apart from that, of course, they will take the battery into their mouth, and they will get some extra zazz out of that, yes. 
I was devastated when Herr Ravensburger came back and says, no, that's not quite what we wanted. <laughs> Age group 8 plus. Um, so we need to add a little bit more to it. But it's really, this is the start of the technology which is in these big games. So we, add need, we need to add a little bit more. So more. <laughs> um, so you touch here. And this lamp goes on. You touch here and this lamp. And you touch here, you go this one. Of course, what we do is we have the conductive ink, not over the whole board, but in segments which lead back. So what have we done? We have actually now allowed the light bulbs that stand for electronics, the electronics to recognize where we are. We have different spaces on the board, and suddenly the electronic knows where we are. That's a big achievement. <coughs> the next thing is, of course, it's not our finger who's playing, which is playing, it's our figure that is playing. So the question was then to the technical team, can we not recognize figures? And eventually they worked something out by different resistances in the different figures. So there isn't even a chip in there, it's just a resistance, resistor. Um, and so now it's when you touch it, this one, when you touch it, this one, when you touch it, this one. So now we cannot only recognize where we are, we can also recognize who we are. And of course, we can combine of these. And when you go to different spaces, it still recognizes who you are. And so the next thing we had is the battery. This is great. We tell people you touch the battery and then the current goes through your body and it goes there. <laughs> yes. oh. So what we had to do, and what of course is natural, we hide the battery and we put the battery also in the little button you touch. And so you touch here and you touch there and like magic it goes. Well, if you have one of these buttons, we can have more of them. So what do we do with this? Well, that means essentially we can have different actions we can take with our figure on each space. So when I touch there, something else happens. When I touch there, something else happens. And of course, as I've already indicated, we don't have the light bulbs. We have an uh, electronic unit there. And then you can program all the software. And you get all the input. Where am I? Who am I? And what do I want to do? So then you have the whole range of the magic can, can unfold. It's actually quite magic if you look at it and you just say, I put the figure on the board and I touch the figure and say, I'll ask somebody, I'll search something, I'll fight. Uh, and it all happens. And then, of course, I mean, programming is straightforward. Then you can just put any logic, any program, any game in it, what you want. So that's how it all started, essentially with a light bulb and a battery. And what came out of it? A number of games. The first game that came out of it was King Arthur. I remember very well once we had explored, so to speak, the technical possibilities that uh, over a long <coughs> Christmas period we worked out a number of different themes and then discussed which one would be the best one. And we decided on King Arthur, even so it's a little bit boys oriented. Um, this is not the game I want to talk about. It's just the first one in the series. So I'll just say a few words about it. What essentially happened is now we have a nicer uh, design board with all the conductive ink on it. We have the figures there. And we are knights who want to pull the sword out of the stone and become the king of England. Um, and so what we do is we walk with our knight around on the board. There are various adventures coming up. And uh, it allows us to get glory points. And also there are various castles we need to vi visit. And then we hopefully collect a lance, a horse, and an armor and with enough dragons slain and maybe some damsels in distress saved, um, we can go back to the stone and we can take out the sword if we have achieved it as the first player. So it's a competitive game and that's a storyline, but it's really the basis of uh, that's the technology. And then of course you can throw lots of different challenges, lots of different surprises at people. The second game in the same series, which followed two years later, is the island. There is no English language edition of this. Um, the island, we went a little bit upmarket. Again, it's not the game I want to talk about, therefore, very, very briefly. Um, you arrive as sailors with a ship on the island. The island is very mysterious. It's in ruins. You explore the island, and you discover that there is a bad volcano, and it spits out different monsters. So what you're trying to do is there are also some mysterious <coughs> statues on the island and you can awaken the statues by collecting certain relics and bringing them to the guardians and the guardians give you nice stone tablets and you take them to the 
uh, statues and try to awaken them. If you have many different colors, you give them. There are two outstanding points here, or remarkable points, I believe. One is that the electronic allows you to find relics on each space, but how many relics you find depends on how long the space was not visited. So if I haven't been there for a long time, I find more. If I go there right some after somebody else, I might find nothing or very little. Um, and the second point is we have two different victory conditions. You are, on the one side, fighting uh, the monsters. You get very few monster points for them. And you are exploring and reviving the island, and you get lots of islands points for them. If the game ends in a way that all seven monsters are on the board, then we have essentially lost the game. And it means only our monster points count, because the island is not safe, so who cares about the island culture points? It's only the monster points, the few monster points that count. However, if we can finish the game by at least reviving one of the statues before the monsters come out, and hopefully all four of the statues, then we have an instant victory, then all our points count. And of course, that gives a very nice, uh, so to speak, back and forth uh, mechanism, because you explore the, the, the island, you collect many points, you see, oh, there are all these monsters around it. The, the island is not going to make it. So everybody abandons the island and jumps on the monsters because these are the points which will win. And then, of course, almost all the monsters are slain. And you say, ah, <coughs> what do I do with these few monster points? I need all the island's points. So people neglect the monsters and go to the island. And so it goes back and forth, and it usually gets very, very tight at the end what is going to win. <coughs> Good. So now, finally, we arrive at who was it? In who was it, we decided to go much lower in the age. It's, it's actually titled as a children's game. Uh, it's, I think it's very hard on the boundary between a children's game and a, uh, a family game. I think in America, in, in Germany, with a lot of deep playing culture, children's games are sometimes very sophisticated. And I think I would certainly classify that for other markets as, an, as a family game. You can say it. Americans are stupid. <laughs> no, no, it's, no, it's about play experience and play culture, yes. Uh, so one thing which is very important to point out, uh, we've actually, I've actually developed this game for the technology I described. But in the process, we actually decided to change technology. For one reason is we wanted to get away from the very big boxes where the other two games were in, because we had a problem in folding the board with the conductive ink. We didn't trust that that, that would really hold for a long time. And so we couldn't fold them, whereas here in this one, we can fold the board. And it's also a <coughs> slightly cheaper uh, technology uh, because it's somewhat independent of all the, all the actions which go on on the board. So what we have done is we have actually taken an independ independent box and put all the information into the box. As we are no longer linking the electronics to the board, we of course need to now tell the electronics what we are doing and where we are. So the magic disappears a little bit. Uh, and of course, I didn't want to say, well, what's the name of this area in the castle? What's the name of this room? And then you have to input the room. So what we did is, particularly for the kids, we said, we put one animal into each room. And then you go to the room, and then you say, I spoke, you speak to this animal, or I look around there. And so you just touch the animal, and then you say what you're doing. So essentially, you're still replicating relatively easily the magic. But what we do no longer know is who I am, because I'm touching, and the thing is not reading fingerprints, so I don't know who I am. And that created some challenges. Uh, the challenges in my eyes when you combine electronic games with physical games is always the, 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 the interface, the input-output challenges. So uh, what we need to avoid in all cases is double bookkeeping. Because if you allow that the electronic unit counts something and we count something, we'll get out of sync. The players make mistakes. I mean, it's natural that we don't have the complete bookkeeping. But it's not the player saying we made a mistake. The players always say the electronic is wrong. Yes? And so <laughs> you, you can't do that. And with this respect, we needed to be very careful uh, what we do. So essentially, when you talk to the, to the um, 
to the dog and you're not on the space of the dog, the unit will not check that. The unit will allow you to do that. Uh, we, have an, we have a little um, ghost in there. Uh, the unit will trigger the movement of the ghost and the effects, but if you implement them, if when the ghost moves four spaces and you only move three, we are not checking this. So we have very strictly divided what is checked by the unit, what is, so to speak, accounted for by the unit, uh, the hints you get because <coughs> this is a, a deduction game, uh, or what is accounted for by the players, and so that the players make sure that they play correctly, or if they cheat. I mean, some people take pleasure out of cheating the unit uh, to do better, and if, uh, if, if that's what gives people uh, satisfaction to gather together and to cheat an electronic unit, that's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> so far we have talked a little bit about the base technology, and there were some, for me, very uh, surprising learnings in there. When I look at the King Arthur game, we had a lot of subtle elements in the background. For example, there was a black knight, and the black knight, when meeting the black knight was always bad news. And what I built into the background is when the black knight shows up on one space, next time he moves one space on, so he almost moves like an invisible figure. Um, most of the players never caught this. For them, the, the Black Knight just showed up uh, randomly, and then two, spaces late, uh, two turns later, it showed up some, uh, somewhere else randomly. So all the subtleties in the background um, didn't really come through for the general public. Or we have, uh, on the board, we have a, a little island where you go over a river, and there's a bridge, and there's a knight, and the knight is actually a very sophisticated per per personality. The knight uh, stands there, and she essentially bars you from going over so easily over the bridge. And what people then do is, well, let me over, so I'll fight you. And so they fight him, and they eventually make their way through. And then, of course, once they have done, done their stuff on the island, they want to come back. And so they already know this is an evil knight, and we need to fight him. And so it's always the fighting side. Whereas, and, and of course, once you have gone onto the, onto the kind of uh, controversial path with the knight, <coughs> then he will stay controversial and as an enemy. But then, so people never try it out to say, well, what happens if I actually give him a gift? What happens actually if I do other things? Because I have many different actions I can do with the knight. And then the knight con works very differently. Suddenly the knight helps you, gives you hints what you do on the island. Uh, there's a ferryman. He actually says, you don't need to come back here. You can go there, go to the interesting castle, and then take the ferryman. And if you're ugly to him, the ferryman may never show up. So it's all of the things in the background where I noticed if you make them too indirect, people either do not even get there, or at least they don't see the magic of, of the variety in there. So I thought we need to bring these experiences much more to the foreground. And that's what we did in the, in the island, because there you know, okay, I go to the space, I find relics, and if the other players haven't been there for a while, I find more relics. Uh, so it's, it's much more direct what I do. Uh, I know I need to revive one of the statues, so I go to the Guardian. The Guardian tells me what I need to find. I can find the stuff. I get stuff from the, from the Guardian. So we put that much more in the foreground, and we actually went one step further with uh, who done it, uh, who was it actually, who was it, um, and made it relatively straightforward, relatively obvious what you need to do, particularly because we're talking to a younger audience. So with this respect, I'm going away a little bit from the technology now, and I'm talking about gameplay very briefly. I wanted to give the game a very strong motivation. Uh, and with this respect, we have developed a story why we as children are actually in this situation. The story is we have a nice uh, castle, and there's a king living in the castle, and there is also um, a kingdom around it, and there is the evil, there's always something bad as well, uh, the evil wizard who is waiting on the borders of the kingdom to do bad things to us. But the king has a magic ring, and the magic ring protects us all. One night, or one morning, uh, the king wakes up and the ring has gone. Big panic in the castle. The ring has stolen, we need to find who has stolen the ring. So soon all the adults from the castle jump on their horses and ride out of the castle gate to find who has taken the ring. And now that's our story. Now comes the cat. The cat is the narrator of the game. The cat comes up, and of course we know that kids can speak to the cat, uh, to, the, uh, to the animals. So the cat comes up and speaks to the children, says, 
these stupid animals, uh, sorry, not animals, these stupid uh, adults. Uh, I, talked, I tried to talk to them all morning. It said, I was sleeping in front of the castle gate. Nobody went in and out overnight. The thief uh, on the ring still must still be in the castle. But now, of course, all the adults are gone. So the only people who can save the world are the kids. It's us. So now we have essentially the task and the seriousness of what we need to do because <coughs> the evil wizard has, of course, got information about this and he is already sitting on his horse and riding towards us and at six o'clock tonight he will be here and if you haven't found the ring the world will end. <laughs> that was the setting so I've already talked about this one here. Um, the game is fully cooperative I think I have somewhat indicated that already so there's no individual winner you either win or you lose together which of course helps if the electronic cannot identify which player does what. So it makes it much easier. Uh, we take it in turns, and if one player doesn't take his or her turn, it's still OK. It also, I think, when we later talk about the success of the game, I think this is one of the success criteria for the game, that people get actually an enormous sense of uh, togetherness and uh, experience together in the group if you're not playing to win against the other, but you're playing together to win and you're sharing information, you're helping each other to win. Of course, I've already indicated that's in the story. We want to find out who has taken the ring. And it must be somebody who lives in the castle. So we have all these people here lined up uh, who, can, who are potential culprits. There's one of them has taken the ring. Deduction, I find very difficult to do in a game which is supposed to be fun and fast moving. We have very few examples like Clue or Cluedo where you actually have serious deduction in there. Most other deductions are actually not deduction. They are kind of accounting and doing something which gives, is a pseudo discuss, uh, discuss, uh, de uh, deduction, which kind of gives you the feeling I have solved the case, but you haven't really done a logical solution of the case. Uh, and we have done that in, in here as well, because how the game actually works, and this is again showing you to bring the mechanism very much to the forefront, so there's nothing hidden, nothing subtle in the background which people might not detect. When you play, you move around with your figure, and you are then in a room, and you can take various activities in the room. For example, you can speak to the animal, and the animal will say, well, I'm hungry, bring me a piece of sugar, bring me uh, a cheese, bring me some milk. <coughs> you can also, in the various rooms, look around. And in each room, you will find something. So if you go into one of the rooms, you may find a bone. And of course, so you find more and more things, and you know of more and more animals what they want. And so all together, we'll try to keep in mind what we need to bring to whom. The cat helps us in carrying the stuff. We have a limit in carrying. And when we bring the right stuff, like the piece of cheese, to the parrot, then the parrot is actually very happy. And he will eat the cheese, and, or she will eat the cheese. And then they will give us a hint. And the hint is kind of, well, I was very much up there uh, sitting, was hiding behind uh, the cupboard. And I saw the culprit going by. I could only see his hat, and he had a, a black hat. And then, of course, you can look at the pictures, and you can exclude people. Uh, and actually, we help people and say, now you can exclude one or two, uh, two culprits. So what we're actually doing is we're giving you a hint, and the hint is nothing more but a countdown to finally one culprit, and then you have solved the case. Of course, people think they have done the deduction, uh, and it's very nice for the kids. Uh, but you have a counting thing, how many clues do I get? I also want to talk a little bit about the development of the game. Uh, how do we develop something like this? Not just from a technological point of view, but from the gameplay point of view. Um, of course, we had our own cardboard pieces. We had the board, which actually looks very much still like the final board. We had our pieces, what we can find in the different rooms. And we had our culprits or our suspects.
And once we had all the pieces together and thought, OK, we have an idea how this could play, <coughs> knowing the potential of the electronic, what we can do and what we cannot do, we actually made a paper simulation. That means we had one game master, one person who played the electronic unit. I had a, this is our original play sheet. So you, you see the, the board. Uh, so you know where certain things are. You see the things you can find. You see the animals you can talk to. You see the various hints you get. And this is actually a more um, evolved play sheet already, because we found out as when we did that that just saying, I need the cheese, I bring the cheese, I get a hint, was a little bit too straightforward and too direct. So we tried to put other hints in there, not just a hint for the, for the culprits. And one of them was that we actually locked some of the doors. So there are some parts of the castles you cannot get to at the beginning of the game. And then you need to get a hint where is the secret lever which you can use. And then you go there, you, 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 you use the lever, and then the door opens up. And once the wizard comes back and once you are in there in the tower, he actually closes it again. And then the panic is big, how do I get out there and how does the others, do the others help me to get out? Uh, the other thing we found is also that uh, we want to give people some extra keys which they can find because in the end of the game, you need a key once you have found, uh, you think you have the culprit, you need a key to go to the chest and unlock the chest. Uh, and if you know that time runs out, because that's the thing, we start at lunchtime, and at 6 o'clock, uh, the game is over, so you, you hear the, the, the bell ringing, and uh, it's 3 o'clock, it's 4 o'clock, it gets even, even tighter. And uh, if, if it's 5.30, you might actually want to take a guess if you have only got two, uh, two culprits left because otherwise you lose. And if you are lucky enough to find one or two more keys, you can actually open one, more than one box. But there are also other temptations where you can use keys to open up shortcuts on the board and help you throughout the game. So you always have to see, do I just spend them now and then I run out of keys at the end? Or do I keep the keys and then have more trials at the end to find the suspect? Of course, what followed then is relatively clear. that this picture has been corrupted. <laughs> wow. Okay, this picture has been corrupted. Um, but it's relatively clear we have uh, then a laptop. And what we did is we, uh, first of all, used all the languages we wanted uh, in text. So essentially, the, the laptop just displayed the text. And when we then thought we had the final version, we actually uh, spoke all the text as well, so that the, the laptop actually gave us uh, the impression of playing the game, <coughs> just not with the electronic, with the final unit, but with the laptop doing stuff. And that was also the point. I remember very well at that time, I gave myself the pleasure of living a few months in Vienna, which is a very nice city which in, in Austria, which I can recommend, very cultural. And I remember playing with lots of kids in, in Vienna and uh, seeing how they react to it and how the whole game works. And of course, we had some changes and some tuning in there. One of the main tunings was actually that I saw that people play with different levels of sophistication. Yeah, some are more experienced, some are less experienced, some are brighter, some are less so bright, if you want to say that less than this. And uh, what we actually built in is we built in a nice ferry, and the ferry every now and then comes along and helps you. For example, gives you an extra turn. And of course, the unit can monitor how brilliantly you play. If you asked the unit, if you go to the animal and ask, what do you want to eat? And it says cheese. And three turns later, I go again and say, what do you want to eat? Cheese. I haven't got any new information. So you can waste turns. You can search in rooms where there's nothing to find anymore because you have already found everything. And the unit can, of course, monitor how effectively you play. And what we did is if you play less effectively, then the fairy helps you more because you need more help. You're still not playing as well as if you played uh, very effectively, but it still it, it pulls you up to a level where you can still win the game. OK. Um, the part which is coming now, I'll do relatively quickly, because it has not so much to do with game design. That's more the publisher's work. Um, so what we see here is, uh, of course, uh, China was involved, and they actually developed the electronic box. So that needed to be tested. Uh, wow. I have to apologize. Why is this thing doing it? Well, I have a Windows environment. This is a Macintosh environment. I don't know. Uh, so here you see the, um, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the Tone Studio. I apologize for that. Here you see the, the studio 
uh, well, here you were supposed to see the studio where all the sounds were recorded. So with the actors uh, who actually um, had great fun in doing all the all the um, animals. And then we are back in Ravensburg in the production, of course, all the cardboards, the boxes, and so were produced as well. So at the fi and finally, from uh, the assembly line, we had the finished game coming out. Uh, and it went into the market in late 2007. And we were, I believe, very successful with the game. In 2008, we won the Children's Game of the Year in Germany, and we won the German Children's Game Prize or award, the two major awards in Germany. Uh, we were the best-selling game of all games in Germany in 2008. We were the best-selling game of two in 2009 of all the games, so we even outsold the new game of the year in, this year, in, in that year. And in 2010, we failed slightly. <laughs> we, were <laughs> <laughs> we were only the second best-selling game. And I fear it's still looking good this year, but I think we're losing our second place as well this year. But nevertheless. And uh, you also see that now more tra language translations are coming out, uh, particularly the English language, which I was very keen on, because once you have English, you have actually opened up the world. Uh, I already said, I think one of the success criteria which I see is the cooperative game. Um, it's always so easy. I I have a critical view towards marketing people, because marketing people can always explain in hindsight why everything works nicely. But if you look ahead, they find it much tougher. And therefore, I question if they really have the right explanation in hindsight as well. So my very dubious explanation at, in hindsight is I think the cooperative aspect of the game uh, was relatively new for the people and gave them a, an exceptional experience when playing. I think that's part of the success. Uh, probably the main success is uh, the, the hybrid character of the game. We still have a game where you sit around the table, where you play uh, together, where you move your figures on the board, but then the whole magic of the electronics comes in, and we know that from a certain age onwards in the, in the board gaming world, we lose the kids to the electronics, and when we are lucky, they come back later from the electronics and come back to, to the, to the uh, paper games as well. And I, I think when you play in the family, there are different attractions. The kids like the electronics, they like the, the atmosphere, the voices that come out of it. Uh, the adults like that you can actually help your child, and you don't have to do it in a hidden way. Yeah, I let you win. No, we all want to win together, so how can I actually, even if you're a new player, how can I get you into the game? I can honestly give you the best advice because I'm interested that you do best. And I think that all comes together in this atmosphere that people like the game a lot. So how did it continue from here? Well, if you can do one adventure, we can do two adventures. So this is the second adventure we did, uh, which I'm now giving you a secret which has not been published, and I decided even so it is on camera, I will say it. Uh, <laughs> we decided we wanted to do a second game, but we also saw that there was an enormous, when you do new technologies, there's an enormous investment in the, in the beginning, and so the margins, even so the game was selling well, and of course that was before we knew about the very big success of the game. Uh, we said, uh, Ravensburg essentially said, we need to find a good way not to have enormous costs in this one as well. So they gave me the challenge, and this is an internal secret. And uh, it has not gone out, but I think after these years, and as, as the success is there, I can say it. We're actually using exactly the same software in this game. Uh, so all we did is we exchanged uh, the sound files. Um, we've never published that so far, so maybe I'm a dead man when I come back to <laughs> Germany. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think we have done it in a very intriguing way. And one of uh, the people I work with, Sebastian Bleasdale, had this ingenious idea uh, that he said, why can't we turn everything around? That means, why can't we fix the food? Because at the moment, of course, we have fixed uh, uh, rooms in the castle. So now we are fixing the food, and the rooms move, move around. And the rooms become people. And what happens is that there is a cursed by a gnome from a gnome and the people are confused and so because they're confused they cannot find the houses where they live houses now means the food yes and also they have keys in their pockets which don't fit to their houses anymore yes uh, and so with this respect what you now do is you go to a person 
and you look around. That means I, I uh, go to the room and look around what I find, and I find a key. Or I talk to the person and say, which house do you want to go to? Which house do you want to live in? That means, what do you want to eat? Yes. And then I can also go and, and look to the various houses and discover things in the houses, which is how I discover the foods. Yes. So we, we turn it on its head, and suddenly the game feels very, very different. Of course, with a different story behind it, with, uh, with uh, different challenges. And we also did the trick that we do no longer have uh, the suspects and the animals from the first game separate, but we actually have the people, that means the locations in the first game, that means the animals, uh, identical to the suspect. So one of the people we want to find, and this one we want to identify. And so uh, I think we managed to hide that relatively nicely. <laughs> and now the secret is out. Uh, I think that you need to say when you do, do I, uh, the making of. And we had this game out. Now comes another critical thing, which I need to say nicely because the camera is on. Um, I would have much liked, and this is sometimes the discussions you have with the publisher, I would have much liked to stay in the same viewpoint with the second game and in the same world as the first game. So I would have liked to live in a town uh, around the castle in the same world. I would still have liked to be the children and to solve another mystery. Ravensburger thought it is better to go in a completely different quirky world and we are now lo no longer the children, we are actually the animals. We are animals now, and we are looking for our master, and that's the one person we want to identify. Uh, and I've, I felt that the story became less consistent and less for me to identify with. I don't want to be an animal. I, I can be the kid, and I'm having the second adventure there, so I'm missing the world a bit. <laughs> and that was one of the points why I then decided not to do a third adventure. Adventures, because who knows, when you get become an animal in the second adventure, what are you going to become in a third adventure? <laughs> <laughs> so, but I picked up the opportunity. Yeah, I, I, I didn't show you this, this one. So you see, you see the world looks uh, very quirky. Uh, the graphics is very different. The radio speaks to you. It's a much more modern world, much different world. So I took the opportunity to, oops, no, I jumped one, to go somewhere else. And that's uh, maybe some of you know the Labyrinth game. It's quite famous, quite uh, well known. And so I took the opportunity to do another box. And again, that's very up to date. That was just released last week in Essen in the big show, which you should all go to because it's heaven. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not an investor in the show, but it's just heaven. Yeah. Uh, and so I took the opportunity there to build an electronic game around it with using the same um, technology as we have in Who Was It? <laughs> uh, you go into the labyrinths, you, need, you meet a lot of different characters. The characters give you tasks. The characters are all in trouble because there is the evil witch, Grimelda, who has put a curse on the, on the uh, uh, labyrinths. And there is the uh, magic book. Uh, and the magic book speaks to you, and you're trying to help the characters there. So that's the latest one of these technologies. I think also it will be the last one of these technologies, at least as far as I go, because even so, these are very new products which are coming out at the moment, which are really up to date since one week now on the market. Uh, as you know, us as designers, we are working not on the products which are released this year. We're not working on the products which were released next year. We are working on products for now 2013 or 2014. And so, of course, we have moved on, and I am in the meantime, very fascinated about these smartphones. And uh, you may know the one or the other of our applications out there. The very newest ones, which I'm really addicted to because I'm, I'm on the leaderboard at the top, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, is Lines of Gold. And uh, I could talk about this for hours because I am designing specific things there. And I'm also, of course, always hint looking for publishers for the iPhone games. Um, but I guess this is uh, an opportunity for a different talk. So in the meantime, I say thank you. And on the electronic side, on the, I on the Apple Store and the iPhones, beat me if you can. <laughs> thank you. Um, questions or comments, anyone? If not, I have a couple. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <coughs> playing a completely cooperative game, especially with children, do you have trouble with the older children or the bossier children just telling the other one what to do? And that's really a one-player game, not a multiplayer game. 
this is always a challenge you are, you're facing, and it's, it's a real challenge you're facing, and we, we had that partially in The Lord of the Rings, which is a very different type, but it's a cooperative game. Um, I, th I think you cannot completely avoid it, but I think what you can do is, in The Lord of the Rings we did it, that you have cards in your hand and you cannot show the cards to other people, so you give people kind of, the individual players kind of hidden information or their own information, uh, or you give them a selfish aspect, like again in The Lord of the Rings, I do not want to die on the corruption track, so I'm so close, I'm not going to do it. Uh, or even the, the other thing which I find much more <coughs> fascinating, that people actually sacrifice themselves out of the game just to make the group win, which is for me the ultimate experience in the game. Um, in the children's game, it comes from people sitting in different rooms and essentially having the box in front of them and saying, so what do I do? I, I speak to the animal, I look around, and they develop their own mind. Let me try out this and let me try out that. So it depends a little bit on the occasion. I haven't mentioned that you can try magic in there and there are some other things you can try out. So in the end, there is no fixed solution for that. There's no real solution for that. There's always the risks there. There are some measures you can take. In the end, I think it comes down to playtesting and see, does the game lend itself to somebody dominating it? Or is it naturally, I think it's more the natural flow, is it naturally flowing so that people take their own actions? Yes. But it's a very good question. There is, there is no, there's no solution to that in the end. Yes. Uh, yeah, and we'll, are we using the mic um, going up for, for recording purposes? Is that why? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Testing, testing. It says on. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, it goes into the oh, camera. Oh, it goes into the camera. Hello, camera. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't amplify in the room. It's just like Yeah, a, just, just in the Okay, so you're speaking to people in the virtual world. Wait, you don't want to? Yeah. Um, uh, so I was just going to say, I thought that was an, an interesting question, kind of. Um, but as someone who was a younger sibling, right, I lost every game I ever played with my older sibling. So I might have actually found that really kind of pleasurable, you know, that like all of a sudden we win as a team instead of I have an experience of losing every game I ever play. <laughs> Can you hand it back to me? Sure. Um, another, yeah. Down here, perfect. So it seems uh, a lot of players that are uh, familiar with with video games now are get they're, they're reluctant to learn all the rules for a board game and the setup time as well. Mm -hmm. Does does using these uh, electronics help with either of those issues? Um, yes and no. Um, I think you can put much more into a game when you have an electronic component in it because all the setups. I mean, we can have a very varied world at, world at the moment. If it doesn't matter in this game, so the hints are always different. You find different things in different places. Uh, it would be very difficult to do that manually. And if you did it manually, then you would have to describe exactly how you shuffle the things, how you lay them out, and how you do the things. Yes. Even worse in, in King Arthur, where we couldn't have the knight reacting in such a sophisticated way. Yes. Uh, so uh, the electronic helps you. Uh, in making a more complicated setup. And I think the electronic therefore also helps you in kind of going in the way of, oh, we can just try it out. You need a few basic rules saying, okay, in, let's, say King, let's say King Arthur, you move to a space. In the space, you can do various actions. The actions are described here. I fight, I befriend, I give a present, I run away, and so on. And then people can just try it out. And then you say, OK, there are also playing cards in the game, and you can gain them there. So it, you can actually quite naturally go in there. The same with this one here. Uh, you just need to, I, mean, I explained the rules to you, yes? You go around, you can do certain actions. The, the animal will tell you what it wants. You bring the animal what it wants. The unit tells you, OK, now you have got this hint. You can take the hint out. Uh, so it gets shorter. If you look at the rules in there, and that's the other side of it, Ravensburg is very conservative. They say, yeah, but we better make sure that everything is exactly described in the rules. So if you look at the rules reflect, it's actually quite <coughs> big again because it describes all the things the electronic does as well. We could have made it much shorter, but that's, again, that's the point how the individual publishers approach it. Yes, it doesn't deny the, 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 the principal point on that. Yeah. Ryder, I have a quick question for you. Sure. A lot of your work is distinguished by systems that are extremely well-tuned. I think that's sort of part of what you're known as in, in the game world systems where 
games often lead to a very close dramatic finish. I think even in your description of, of the island game, for example, you describe that, that sort of system. Um, what I'm curious about is when I've, I've read a little bit about your creative process, you wrote a, wrote a great essay in Rules of Play about your process of Lord of the Rings, and you talk about how in the early stages of a game you often will sort of think, think through a system, sort of almost meditate or contemplate mm -hmm. on it. What I'm curious about is when you do that first iteration, do you find that you're, you, you, you more or less get it right the first time and it's a matter of tuning, or do you have sort of wild swings and... Um, sort of radical iterations that go on, or maybe it varies from game to game. I'm curious about I'm curious about that idea of sort of meditating on a design and then implementing it after maybe you, you even described several weeks of just thinking about a design yes. before you actually test it. I my tendency is to sort of build a prototype as quickly as I can. So I'm, I'm curious to hear you talk about your process. Yeah, that's one of the great questions always. How quickly do, do you go to prototype? If I feel always. Uh, I tend to go late to prototype. Uh, I'm not saying this is the right thing to do, this is my weakness or my tendency because it always works so nicely in my head, yes, and <laughs> everything fits together. And uh, so I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I try to see everything exactly, but of course the downside is you can completely sway off in the wrong direction and then you play it the first time and you see it's just dead and there's nothing to save. On the other hand, if you go, but I, I enjoy that process a lot and it, it, for me something changes when I go to prototype very quickly. Uh, then, of course, it's a very rough thing and you might not actually get a proof of concept or the feasibility of it. And for me it changes once I have a prototype, um, I don't feel so free anymore to work with it. It becomes more a, uh, now I need to do it, yes. Uh, it's, it's psychological, so I try to sp spend a lot of time in, in this very free environment. Uh, I mean. There's so many answers to this. The, the other answer is, um, people always ask me, yeah, are you not running out of ideas? And th the point is not the ideas. I mean, when you read some of my interviews, you will know about my, my drawers. Each drawer has, uh, I had 90, now I have only 60. But each drawer contains one game, uh, which is in development. And I'm actually not proud of filling these drawers. It's, it's in an hour I can, in a, in a team meeting, in a creative meeting, can easily fill one or two of these boxes with new ideas where you think, oh yeah, that works and, and so on. Uh, I'm actually proud of emptying these because filling them, it takes an hour, but emptying a box, if you, either you kill it, and that takes some, how shall I say, emotional energy to kill one of your children, uh, <laughs> or uh, it takes months to make an idea into a real product which is, then really ideal for the market, it is a perfectly marketable product. So I find it much more the challenge to go through this development process rather than having the initial idea. Yes. More, okay, maybe we'll take uh, just a couple more questions and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll head to our break. Hi, so I, I have a two-part question. The, I am curious about the mechanic in the island where the uh, the relics uh, replenish after not having been searched for a while, I, does that work on a uh, by tracking how many turns have gone by? Uh, yes. And so it uh, it, it occurred to me uh, that uh, I was confused at first and wondered whether it was tracking real time. So I'm I'm wondering whether you've done any experiments, especially with the electronic games that uh, are based on a on an actual timer that's counting down. You know, similar to if you had an hourglass in a non-electronic game. So the, the answer to the first part is it is, it is turn-based, uh, so it is not real-time. As far as I can see, I have not done any real-time games. I still find them very fascinating, and uh, I should get my time around them to, to do some. We have discussed a little bit there, but uh, it also needs, I think now with the technology in place, I mean, of course, you can do party real-time games. You have a send timer, and uh, I have something like I need to describe a word and can't say the word, and how quickly can we do it, and this card, and then the team needs to guess. Yeah, it's, it's a round object which you kick into the goal. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, these games, of course, you can do real-time, but that's not really what you're saying. Real-time is more, can I actually put ourselves under this pressure. And I think it is very hard to do that in a pure paper, uh, in an analog game, because there is a lot of handling, and the handling shouldn't count. And once you have to do the handling very quickly to run the game better, I think it becomes disappointing. It becomes a different uh, challenge. So, but now with all the electronics we have and all the affordable electronics we can do, I think it is much more open to it. Um, and yeah, I should try one. So, thank you. 
you, I think we're going to take one more question. Does that sound, feel about right? Frank, do you think because this is such an intimate gathering, that people should kind of introduce themselves when they ask a question so you can sort of know who people sure, are? Sure, that's a good idea, yeah. yeah. So that was just Naomi Clark, and here we have... Um, Alex Fleetwood, uh, director of Hide and Seek in the UK. Um, I just uh, had a, I was particularly interested in, in the fact that the starting point for this game was a technology. And um, also that you've mentioned at times that you have a team who you work with. So I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how your design process is collaborative and to what extent there might be specialisms for technologists or engineers or coders within mm -hmm. that team. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a um, very close team of around a dozen people around me uh, who you see in the credit notes usually when, when you look at the, the games. Uh, they are not employed by me, apart from the genius <coughs> Sebastian Bleasdale, whom I mentioned before, uh, but uh, they contribute on a project basis. So the proje there's a programmer there, there's somebody who does more the editing side and so on. But I would meet them, we would meet, I have a regular Monday group, Tuesday group, Wednesday group, Thursday group and so on. So we meet regularly and we play the games and we discuss the games and uh, I I, I often I just ask the right questions and eventually somebody will have the right answer. So it's, it's more the creative process whereas then the structuring of the process and the actual driving for the development is very much more in my hands and but then it's so it's it's quite it's quite challenging because we'll play a game in the evening. We, of course, we don't only play one; we play two, three different games. And then there are findings and problems. And then I know the next day I need to fix all of this because the next evening the next group will be there, and everything needs to be up to date again. So that keeps myself on the toes, and therefore they hardly let me out of the <laughs> studio. And I always have to work on the next game. Uh, but. Uh, it's also something where we can turn around and push <laughs> things forward quite quickly because if you have the same game and you show it a different group every evening, then you'd see a different, so you never get into the, into the risk of developing a convention with the game and everybody plays this direction, then when you publish it, everybody plays a different direction. Uh, so this is the process with the, with the core team where we develop the game up to a certain level or kill the game, but then there's a second process in there where we go out and I actually tested with casual players. Uh, because you, you, there's, it doesn't matter how much experience you have, you need to test with a target group. And when you put it in front of children, suddenly very different thing happen, happen and all the experience doesn't help you there. Uh, in the end, it's always about finding something new, but toning the new stuff so that it is actually suitable for the target group. I, I mean, essentially what I always say is, uh, when you have a new entry point to a game, and that comes through the creative initial process. That's the best chance to come out somewhere else uh, at the end with something creative. And therefore, this is maybe a good closing sentence, I think game design is not a science. Game design is an art because it's not a 20 step program. If you always start there, run around the 20 steps, you always come out at the same end. That's not what we want to do. We want to be creative. And I think therefore it's much more treated as art. Find some new entry point, get a challenge. That's why I'm getting involved in all these technologies because they give me a new challenge. They force me not to use my standard experience, but force me out of this box and do something new. Thank you. Thank you.